Hello, everybody. Welcome to Flick and Flow. My name is Raimo Benedetti. I'm a video, art a video artist from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I created this project, Flicker and Flow, to investigate, listen, and learn about the archaeology of the moving image. Our, uh, Flicker and Flow is a series of online interviews with scholars, professors, and curators related to pre-cinema and other aspects of the archaeology of the moving image. We have the support of Pontificia Universidade Católica, and UEM, uh, Universidade Estadual do Ma de Maringá. And thanks to Professor Rodrigo Gontijo and Marcos Bastos. We are in the third episode. We have been talking to Stephen Herbert and Martha Brown uh, last week. And today we have the pleasure to present you Professor Erk Hutamu. Erk Hutamu works as a professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, departments of design, media arts, film, television, and digital media. Hutamu is one of the founders of an emerging approach to media studies known as media archaeology. He is internationally renowned media historian and theorist, and also a specialist in history and aesthetics of media arts. His moody media performance, Mariorama Resurrected, has thus far been presented in Los Angeles, Chicago, and Pittsburgh. The lecture performance, Panoramas in Motion, Reflections on Moving Image Spectacles Before Film, was presented at the Short Film Festival in Oberhausen, German. Professor Hutamu's most recent books are Media Archaeology, Approaches, Applications, and Implications, edited with UC Parica, and Illusions in Motion, Media Archaeology of the Moving Panorama and Related Spectacles. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Professor Erke Rutamo. Professor, can you hear us? Well, I can hear everybody perfectly. So, and uh, thank you very much for the, um, this, it's an honor to be included in your series. Thank you, thank Professor. You, professor. Yeah, you know that today we are going to have a special guest which will be uh, in conversation with us, who is Professor Marcus Bastos who is PhD in Communication and Semiotics from uh, Pontificia Universidade Católica de São Paulo, where he is a professor linked to the Department of Arts and to the postgraduate program in Intelligence, Technologies and Digital Design. He published the books Audiovisual Life, Trends and Concepts, Networks, Thresholds and Recycling Culture. He's one of the organizers of the projects besides the screen, and medita mediations, technology, public space, a critical overview of art in mobile media. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Marcus Bastos. Thank you very much to join us here. Hi, hi, Mu, hi, Erki. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to be here. I would like to, uh, uh, to thank you also, Nicole, Pepper Lambert, who is in background, uh, selecting the comments that we are going to have the, during our presentation. So, Erki Hutamu, I think we could start it, uh, talking about uh, uh, media archaeology, no? And uh, uh, can you uh, say to us, when this idea of, or this concept of media archaeology starts? Yes, Raimo. So um, uh, it's a long story, and I think that I have to keep it relatively short. But um, first of all, I always like to say that, I mean, that maybe there is not a media archaeology at all, but there are many uh, media archaeologies in the plural. This means that um, the practitioners, all of the practitioners have something in common, I think, in their thinking, but but there are also important uh, uh, sort of like differences. And um, and I, I normally like to think that this um, media archaeology itself, um, using the, the, the concept, 
started developing sometimes in the late 80s and, and uh, early 1990s. Um, so I personally gave my first keynote presentation in a, in a conference, which is the International Symposium of Electronic Arts in uh, actually Helsinki, Finland in 1994, August. So first time that I gave a sort of like kind of a big presentation where I tried to define the principles of media archaeology. But there were others, um, especially uh, people like um, Siegfried Zielinski from, uh, from Germany, and, and also uh, um, film and um, television scholars like um, Thomas L. Sasser and, and several others uh, who were actually at around the same time beginning to use the word archaeology. Tom Gunning was also one of those. So it, it was not, not one single person uh, who sort of like coined it, but it was more, more like a, some kind of a network of references, which I think uh, did influence each other in, in many ways. But I would say that the first half of the 1990s uh, was a very decisive moment for this discourse on media archaeology to be formed. But is, is, does this group of uh, intellectuals like Thomas uh, Osauser, Tom Gunning, did you met each other before coining it or it was natural? Well, um, I think on that field, there were many links and connections at that time, but, uh, but it didn't always happen uh, so that, you know, people would be coming together and uh, talking about this thing called media archaeology. It was much more sort of like random in that sense. But for example, I met Tom Gunning for the first time at the Pordenone Silent Film Festival in, in, in Italy, where I always used to go and which was a, was a, big inspiration uh, for, for me. Also Charles Musser I met actually at, in Pordenone for the first time. But then with, with uh, people like Zielinski, uh, I was very much involved in, um, in uh, working with media arts. So curating exhibitions with artists, working with um, latest technology, virtual reality technology, interactive technology. And, and so in those circles, we were also talking much about these media archaeological ideas. Uh, I mentioned Toshio Iwai from Japan, the great Japanese artist, and uh, for example, Paul de Marinis, who's a professor now at Stanford University. So Paul and, and to Toshio were artists with whom I was involved uh, early on. And Sigrid Zielinski also was actually oh. having positions in the, like the... Um, the uh, Media Academy in, in Cologne, Germany, so where he came to in, in touch with artists. So I always want to sort of like emphasize the fact that um, this was never, shall we say, never purely an academic effort. It was, it was very much a certain kind of um, effort that covered the interests of the radical artists trying to apply technology at that time. And, 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 and being inspired by, by devices and, and ideas uh, from the past, sometimes many, many, many centuries ago. So, so the, there were many ingredients and many elements that sort of like uh, gradually, little by little, I think, started coming together. Yeah. yeah. Erki, you mentioned that there are several media archaeologies and not only one. So there are different approaches to it, and I would like to know which one is yours. So, um, so yes, there are def different ways, and I think that this maybe this field, if 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 it is a field, so maybe it's a kind of a non-field actually, um, <laughs> uh, kind of a, like a nameless science, like um, in the sense that Abi Warburg uh, hundred years ago uh, used that idea. So. Uh, uh, nameless science means uh, sort of like uh, something that is a combination of many things, but at the same time, it's not one of those 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 things separately at all. So it is somewhere somewhere hovering over and between between those things. So like uh, Siegfried Zielinski, for example, has been coining words like anarchaeology or uh, variantology, and uh, and then there is a very um, strong emphasis on materialities, so the kind of material uh, operations by media devices, which like Wolfgang Ernst uh, is, is strong on that, influenced by work of Friedrich Hitler, for example. So my idea 
is of course um, often linked, um, known as the topos archaeology or media archaeology as topos study, where my interest is looking at the way how, ways how certain ideas, motives uh, uh, travel uh, through through media history, sometimes meeting each other, sometimes being forgotten and disappearing, and then reappearing again. And I came to think that this kind of operations, which are partly psych cyclical or, or spiral-like operations, um, uh, played a very important role in, in the formation, what, what we these days call media culture. So I think my, my work is, is a contribution to understanding such processes that, that during, uh, I mean, uh, different ways of saying how long it's taken. It's taken a very long time, so to get to where we are these days today. But I would maybe also want to just very briefly mention that, that uh, so my work, I, I do, I spend a lot of time with, with documents and machines and devices from the past, but I'm equally interested in, uh, in the contemporary moment. So understanding the media culture as it is today. So for me, media archaeology is very much a certain kind of an ongoing dialogue between different moments in time, different places also in time. And this is, of course, an open-ended um, uh, sort of like conversation. It will, it will never come into an end. But, but as we look at these links and connections, I hope that little by little we start understanding some of the fundamental elements and things that constitute media culture a little bit better. We have a we question. Have a question. You mentioned. Mentioned. Sorry, Haimo, do you want to say something or should I go? No, uh, yeah, I had a question from Rafael Luna, but uh, go, Marcus, and then we we make the his question. Okay. No, it's related to what Erki just said, but I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit longer on that, Erki, because you mentioned that you are at the same time in relation with the past, with all the equipment and the sort of thing or sort of things, and sometimes from centuries and centuries ago, and at the same time involved in curating cutting edge artists and this sort of thing. So how is this connection between past and future and how knowing the past allows us allow us to understand better the present and somehow anticipate the futures of media cultures? Um, uh, so, so Marcus, you're asking many, many questions in one. So I, um, <laughs> I probably will, um, will um, try to sort of like select maybe one or two two points and maybe we can get to those other points a little bit later in this discussion. So about the work with the artist, because I mentioned that. So, so for me personally, um, I started thinking, you know, let's say when I got to, got to sort of like know the work of, for example, artists like Toshio Iwai, uh, Paul de Marinis, there would be many others also like Lynn Hirschman and uh, Je Jeffrey Shaw and Kenneth Feingold and many, many others too who, who contributed. But I mean that in my case of um, so working with these artists, what I was very fascinated with was the way uh, to see how these artists were identifying certain kind of modes uh, and so we say nodes and elements from the from the past so uh, Toshio uh, for example so he began his career in Japan he was an art student at the University of Tsukuba uh, which was a very famous art department so he um, became interested in in this what what Raimo calls pre-cinematic technologies I, I don't really like this concept as Raimo knows very well because because my work is not only about looking at things that led to the cinema. Okay, we are going anyway, to discuss anyway, that anyway, as well. <laughs> any, anyway, uh, so Toshio got interested in what he saw in books. So he saw pictures of praxinoscope theaters and phenagistiscopes and, and so on. But he didn't at that point have access, you know, like to, to these, these, uh, these physical devices like I do. This is a 19th century, um, Pretty fantastic, uh, zoetrope. So he uh, started building these devices on his own by by looking at only pictures, 
and imagining how from the picture, the representation from the 19th century, you might get to that actual device. And he always mentioned uh, to me that, that this was a very, very important learning experience because it represented a certain kind of handsome experience. He actually was already a hands-on artist in a way as a child because his parents didn't want to buy him toys. They said, well, Toshio, we don't buy you any toys, but we will buy you any material you need to build your own toys. So he was this like a model of a so-called make generation that we talk about now. But anyway, uh, Toshio was, became very interested in then sort of like comparing those experiences. He sort of like reinvented in a way from the past with, for example, technology that he had around him, like Amiga computers and, 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 and Nintendo game consoles and things like that, and started seeing and linking, seeing the links and connections between these devices. And, 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 and very soon he was actually sort of like kind of trying to combine these technological ideas from different moments in time. And, 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 and this became a very foundational sort of like discovery for his great um, career. Um, about Paul de Marini's, um, I just want to mention one thing. I'm, I'm a big, big fan of these artists, both of them. And uh, Paul, for example, has spent a, much, a lot of time with patent archives. So looking at forgotten patents. Uh, and, wow. uh, and, and one of the examples would be the famous telephone patent of Elisha Gray. So there's a big story, part of a mythology of media history that that Alexander Gray and Bell and, and Elisha Gray uh, supposedly came um, on the same day uh, to the uh, patent office in the United States with, with their patents for the telephone. Wow. But Alexander Gray and Blair was said to be there a little bit a few hours before. Ah. <laughs> so this, this means that the, uh, this Elisha Gray became one of the big losers. And these losers are interesting figures for media archaeology because the loser uh, forces you to ask interesting questions. Uh, and this is the sort of like as if version of media history, which I think many media archaeologists are interested in. What might have happened if Elisha Gray had actually been there first, because he had a very different idea of how the telephone would function. So Paul de Marini's got very interested in and uh, the the this forgotten patent by Elisha Gray and found out that this is actually a strange way of thinking about the telephone communication, but it is doable. So he actually, as an artist, technologically oriented artist, started realizing that and then then sort of like using it in his installation uh, uh, series called the gray matter and 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 these things are actually f very inspirational for me still but and i and i was kind of astonished wow this is a, a contemporary technological art practice that that sort of like travels like in a time machine between those moments in time and i thought well this is actually what I'm doing myself. You know, I was organizing some early exhibitions, for example, with head-mounted display. So this was the first wave of VR around 1990. And interactive artworks that were sort of like, at that point, this sort of like the ultimate sort of like avant-garde uh, of this sort of like technological art. And, and I got so interested in like, uh, when I was, putting the head-mounted display on myself, you know, the first experience is a long, long time ago, to think, you know, oh, I'm a historian and I, I already heard about panoramas and stereoscopy and those things. Is this really so totally new and, and unprecedented that like Jaron Lanier, Jaron was running around giving big speeches about that at that time and and I started thinking maybe that's not the full truth, you know. And uh, it was a big inspiration for me to actually to start producing media archaeological work. So, so th th this is a long explanation. But, but uh, so basically, what I was trying to say is that so that in my my particular case, so it was many. There were many uh, sort of like contributing factors that really were sort of like in a kind of a dialogical relationship with each other. And, and this is a certain kind of, uh, I would say, almost dialectic, actually, 
and and this is how these these ideas started popping up in my mind and um, making me ask questions about media media culture a little bit differently i think than the most most existing media history was historical writing was approaching these these similar issues so now we have this question of Rafael Luna. I would like to ask Professor Hutemu for his opinion on Scott, social construction of technology and his possible contribution to a history of audiovisual technologies. Thank you, Rafael. I would actually like to have Rafael to talk, talk to me a little bit about the Scott idea. So I'm not super, uh, so, super familiar with that. And um, maybe, maybe we hear from Raphael, a little bit about this um, this um, uh, background, so that I can reply better. Okay, and he asks also. He comments also. Despite having similarities with proposals of media archaeology, it's not usually cited as a reference or antecedent, unlike new film history, Foucault, or the German media theory. Do you agree? Um, yeah, I, well, this has to do with this issue that I mentioned in the beginning, that, that I think that there are several different kind of media archaeologies. And uh, as a source, maybe I, I'll uh, refer that, you know, we, we tried to deal with this issue a little bit with um, Yushi Parika in this very long introduction we wrote to the, to the book media archaeology that we edited together in 2011. So, so it is not always very simple, for example, to sort of like link these different influences um, uh, with each other. So let's say, in my case, uh, this this whole idea of the um, so like so-called new historicism in the 1980s, which actually came from the field of literary studies and then spread to the uh, historical scholarship, kind of reformist historical scholarship. And then started affecting fields like this, which came to be known as the new art history and also new film history. For in my case, this was a very, very important element because, because it represented a certain kind of a return from, from um, historical awareness after the sort of kind of um, uh, many, many decades of theorizing that, that had to do with um, certain kind of like, um, the, the structuralist influence, which was basically like wiping away structuralist, also Lacanian influence, where the historical dimension did not seem to have playing uh, be playing a very big role. But it was also about this understanding that when we try to sort of like make sense of the past, you know, approach the the technologies of the past, we can never fully uh, uh, explain away our subjective uh, uh, role as an interpreter. So. So we are not able to sort of like exclude ourselves, put ourselves from outside completely from what what we are looking at. And, uh, and this is obviously, I guess, that what Foucault, one of the Foucault's uh, big, big um, issues and contributions. So, so Foucault was a, was a strong interpreter and reader you know, of the past, you know, these, these uh, epistems, but he wasn't excluding himself. It was a, just an issue about uh, controlling, controlling somehow this, this ongoing relationship between the observer and the observed with the interpreter and the interpret, you know, that kind of thing. And I think that this issue, at least the way how I understood this certain kind of a, a move to the a new historicism, was a, was a very important element uh, uh, for me. So and and it's it's it became part of part of my work ever since. So I'm a I'm a trained cultural historian. So I was trained to de deal with uh, uh, with very precisely with the source material, you know, and ask certain kind of questions uh, from the material. And I think that you can see it from my works. But at the same time, so the other element is that that I'm there's a certain feeling of um, skepticism or uncertainty about my relationship with that material, which I cannot and probably don't want to sort of like explain away. So I I am not able to, and I, I I'm not willing to put myself into some kind of an ivory tower. Uh, so instead of that, so I see my particular work as a kind of a I I like 
talking, thinking about time machines, you know. So it's a time machine that travels in a certain kind of space time. And I'm on that time machine, or maybe I am that time machine. And, <laughs> and I am, uh, uh, I am um, uh, not traveling in a linear way, like I would be uh, on a river boat, you know, like just kind of like from, from village to village or, or, or sort of like city to city. Just like the moving panoramas actually function, maybe we will talk about that later. So the river panoramas. So I'm speak, I'm traveling in a in a more sort of like flexible way in the, in this space time. It's not random, but it is linking, trying to link uh, elements uh, with each other and see if some kind of a meaningful uh, constellations kind of like um, uh, become become visible. But this is actually quite different from uh, if we think about this as a thing kind of um, a German tradition that we now um, often often link with the so-called uh, culture technique and cultural techniques research, which many people also take back to the work of Friedrich Kittler. Even though Kittler's work was actually very complex and uh, sort of like multi-layered, it was not just about like technological, uh, you know, like reducing culture to certain technological a priori. So it was more complex than that. But I mean that, uh, so this is a very, very long discussion. So I was just saying that, for example, if we look at the this, this inspiration from like new historicism, which was felt very strongly, let's say in the um, Anglo-American world or all the kind of world where I was operating. And if we compare that with the kind of the, um, those very much more sort of like technologically oriented developments, infrastructure oriented things that was happening in Germany. So it's not, not, not at all obvious how we can, uh, how we can fit these things into a sort of like uh, together into a structure. So that's why maybe media archaeology is this kind of a, uh, um, nameless science, you know. Okay, I would like to propose a change of subject now. Um, the proposed topic would be collections. I know that you have a very large collection with you, and you mentioned Wolfgang Ernst, who also has a collection in the Media Archaeology Fundus in, in Berlin. And so I wanted to ask you, what is the importance of maintaining collections for people who work with media archaeology? And how does the direct contact with objects help you to formulate your thoughts? Well, I, I think the very beginning would be a very personal one, is that uh, I, I do think that certain people have a certain kind of tendency um, to collect things and uh, and what what are the mo motivating factors behind it? That's a, another discussion. So this is something obviously that uh, let's say Walter Benjamin, who is one of the certain kind of a um, kind of key figures in this certain kind of history of of media culture, um, uh, wrote much about, and and it was his personal. Sorry, sorry. And um, and so uh, and another figure would be Abi Warburg, and uh, Abi Warburg, who is a big influence behind my way of doing media archaeology and his idea about the pathos formulas, and uh, but especially the Warburg Library, which was this pioneering, almost like media archaeological resource with a very very special and uh, and a sort of like a strange. Uh, classification system between the box and and uh, different sections of the library that that reflected Abi Warburg's way of thinking about uh, media. So for myself, you know, if we think about the fact that you know I started collecting uh, when I was a little uh, boy, you know, like uh, comic books or the uh, Viewmaster reels and that kind of things. So it was a kind of a logical way to sort of like uh, link um, link those very very early interests with with collecting a more systematical way these these devices that that we we um, sort of like are, are talking about. So in my particular case, so the the definitely the um, it is a certain kind of um, 
it's about multiple factors. One is the certain kind of aura that that's created by actually um, both at, at the university and at my home, working surrounded by, by these devices. So this is a sort of like kind of a, a topos in itself, which if we, <laughs> we can find actually uh, many, many times over many, for many, many hundreds of years, if we look at um, iconographic traditions showing scholars doing work in a study. So you find this tradition uh, uh, going back to the Middle Ages and so. And when I see this kind of illustrations, a scholar silently uh, reading something, studying something and surrounded by his uh, cabin of curiosities or, uh, uh, or devices, I, I do identify with that, that kind of feeling. But I also feel that, you know, that um, when you, especially when you practice media archaeology, it is extremely important that you have to have this first first hand experience about these devices like you, you see in this thing. For example, um, this kind of devices I'm showing here, it is not at all self-evident that people will understand it, it fully uh, without this personal experience. And, and I already told you my, my anecdote about Toshio Iwai, who was actually lacking this, uh, uh, lacking this experience as a student, but who was passionate about understanding these, these fascinating devices. So he, in a way, reconstructed that history by self, you know, from those other sources. But that doesn't always happen, you know, for like humanistic or art scholars uh, who actually uh, are struggling with understanding very little uh, details. For example, I have been hosting um, doctoral students, you know, um, sometimes, you know, writing, uh, wanting to write about camera obscura as a metaphor in the 18th century culture. But it is difficult to do it if you haven't had a chance really to sort of like even touch even a single camera obscura from that time and understand how these elements uh, affect that not only the the material, the physical experience, but also the imagination. So the imaginary around the cultural, cultural um, uh, image, uh, camera obscura. So I've been doing my best uh, to help others. Uh, so uh, if they have a chance to come to my place, so we will take an 18th century camera obscura outside to the light, to the, and I will give the person a chance uh, with a pencil to actually draw a picture with that original camera obscura. Uh, so, so I have, uh, I understand perfectly how paradoxical this is because, because this, this experience is pretty much like denied for most people. So simply because these institutions and collections are not easily and openly available. So, so the, um, so, so the most people actually are forced to sort of like um, uh, create their idea of this aspect of the past indirectly rather than uh, directly dealing with these devices. Uh, and that is, I, th I think it is a, is a very unfortunate thing. And, uh, and, and so the solution here, if we, if we are allowed to imagine and, and fantasize would be probably to, to sort of like find a way of like providing this access much more widely internationally to these devices. Um, obviously some of them are fragile. So, so if I'm having, this is a, for example, uh, early, early 19th century camera obscura. It's a perfectly functioning camera obscura, but obviously you, you cannot uh, give this kind of an um, antique, very rare antique device to uh, just for somebody to go around and, and uh, sort of like fool around in the streets. So it has to be a controlled situation. Yeah, but yeah. I, I do think, but, but uh, so, so just to summarize this, this part of the, the, this, my answer to that question is simply that, that I, I, I do not believe that we fully can understand this media archeological dimension of, of culture 
without some kind of uh, personal uh, uh, sort of like touch and 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 uh, contact with with these devices. Even though my my work, for example, deals much much of it is about the imaginary around the the the, the fantasies and the kind of ima 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 imagined devices and and ideas. But the materiality cannot be uh, ever excluded from that explanation. So it, I think that this understanding the materialities of media, technology, and culture has to be the basis. You mentioned that there are not too many public collections, but are there any of them that are available and you recommend someone that are interested in these topics to visit? Well, there are... Um, uh, unfortunately, far too few. And uh, if we think th think about the fact that media archaeology, based on you know what I see and hear and uh, contacts that I'm I'm getting, so is is pretty much like uh, attracting. Uh, shall we say I would I, I I don't like using the word global. You know this. Uh, Marshall McLuhan talked about the global village, and I think it's a fa fake. It's it's fake. We we don't have a global village, and we will never have a global village. So we 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 have many villages that are interconnected with each other, with with media technology. But they are different villages. They are not just one single village. But I think that there is a lot of interest in media archaeology in many many parts of the um, world. For example, this is a book I. Um, it's a new book I wrote for Japan. This is, is um, uh, a book that tries to give a general idea about media archaeology. It's used in many universities now as a textbook in Japan and so. But even in Japan, you know, it is not easy to sort of like gain access to the these devices. So there are collections, for example, the the um, the so-called uh, Top Museum, T O P. I like it. So it's a actually means the Tokyo Photographic Art Museum. So uh, they have a, a fine collection of these things, but it is uh, displayed only from time to time. And the problem is that it is the, you know, the museological problem is that that it is displayed before, behind, uh, so inside glass cages, you know, this or plexiglass cages. So you don't, you are not given this, this possibility. But obviously, some institutions uh, do provide uh, replicas to play with and that kind of thing. It's pretty common, common in film museums in uh, in Europe and and different kind of places. But um, but I think that this this idea of the of a contact, personal contact with an oratic object, with all these elements, including the smell and the way how the metal of a of a mid 18th century magic lantern. This is a magic lantern that was used by touring snow people in Europe. Uh, so traveling from village to village, this is about 1750. So when, this is one of the all oldest existing magic lanterns. Yeah, in the collection. I, I can suppose. <laughs> yes, and uh, so, so this it, it's something special in the idea that it is possible to sort of like uh, be able to touch and, and, and feel this, this, this magic, which is part of the, 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 the object itself. And this, of course, is linked with the, uh, then the, the possibility of actually bringing these devices back, back to sort of like uh, exhibition practice. I just noticed that Martin Gilbert, who is a great, great magic lantern uh, showman, uh, who's doing super work in England, uh, is, is watching watching this and uh, so Martin and the other uh, uh, people who are practicing what I call this sort of like kind of experimental media archaeology. This is a project actually, by the way, at the University of Luxembourg. I'm part of the part of the team. So it is important step, you know, that not only to look at these things but somehow put them back into the back into the exhibition practice because objects were used for for something and and they need to be used again you know it's a phenomenological aspect of of, of this discussion so we are having many many Hi, questions my... and comments yeah. sorry 
No, that I, I was just going to propose that I ask two more questions about the collection before changing to the audience. But okay. As you Let's... prefer, as you prefer. Yeah, we have many, many people, many questions here. Uh, I would thank you from everyone. So uh, who is watching on the Facebook, please, uh, if you can go to YouTube and make the comment on YouTube, it appears directly from here. Uh, th that's, that question from Sternburger uh, appears in the beginning. Of course, we, we, we go to uh, another place, but just, uh, just to know if you can uh, read her uh, uh, the question. She sure. says, good afternoon. I would hear your, your take on how media archaeology relates on media ecology. I think that's UC Parica uh, speciality, you know? Yes, this is an issue that that um, also often often uh, appears, and uh, and I, I have never sort of like been able to sort of like fully fully figure out myself this relationship. So I have been sort of like more like more like this seeing this as a kind of a parallel parallel development. So the um, media ecology itself is trying to sort of like I think. Uh, broaden the idea about the media culture in a little bit different different ways and uh, and if if i understand media ecology i mean there are also different ideas about media media ecology so we have to remember this too so media ecology is 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 not a certain kind of like a fixed fixed um, fixed concept either so uh, like media archaeology is not a fixed concept and i think that that's not necessarily kind of bad but i mean that so, so the way, and also media ecology, as as understood by Neil Postman and others, is a bit different than than the media ecology understood these days by scholars. So the, these things are also changing in, in time. But I, I do think that media ecology has a certain kind of tendency of sort of like basically taking the media idea of media and and broadening into fields that that are not necessarily about this uh, this sort of like kind of underst understanding that we 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 probably talk about in this series which is based on the anyway that there is a certain kind of technological infrastructure and this is used in history in some ways it is imagined by people and fantasized and and all these connections but but media ecology in that sense takes this idea about media uh, so in a way tries to open it up in a in a in a different way just like the so i mentioned the the um, the um cultural techniques research um uh, from much of it which comes is coming from germany is trying to sort of like open it up as well so i i think that another very difficult question by the way I wonder if anybody will ask is how is media archaeology related with culture, cultural technique and cultural technology, cultural techniques research? And, uh, and this is a similarly difficult question than this question about the media archaeology versus media ecology. So, so basically we can say perhaps that there is a certain kind of a broader, wider, sort of like kind of like um, unstable, fluctuating field within which these three approaches and maybe maybe other approaches are sort of like kind of like um, being uh, sort of like having some kind of um, conversation with each other but it's not explicitly happening very often actually um, uh, yet there are many many questions arriving from media archaeology so let's let's uh, arrange between us that's the last one to go further in other it seems that because we prepared uh, me and marcus another team that we would like to listen about so that's uh folk amok uh, dr hutamu can you talk a little bit about how media archaeology is different for media history and cultural studies both in the german and anglo-american traditions this is a perfect question this is a perfect question you know to follow up the previous one because <laughs> Obviously, we are talking about very essential things, but we are talking about extremely huge and 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 big things. And uh, when when we think about this this idea, for example, media history. So then then we we have to ask the start. We would have to start asking, what defines media history as a scholarship? Is it the, is it the history of communications? You know, like 
but used to come from communications departments and uh, how how is sort of like a, a media history that emphasizes let's say um uh, economic economic history of media then related with a certain kind of a media history that's more like uh, really le leading on the certain kind of cultural studies approach which tries to understand the certain kind of a significance and importance of those media devices you know like at uh, at a certain moment in time for example like um, if we take about the um, uh, early history of the telephone so i mentioned telephone before so tele telephone which was introduced in the <clears throat> in the um, end of the 1870s so so the this is a very standard thing i'm 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 just giving as an example so so the so the idea that the people did not have a fixed notion what the telephone would be used for i think was a was is a very inspiring thing for certain type of like media historical study but the kind of media history which is close to the certain kind of cultural studies approach, which for me is about contextualizing technology within culture. So we can we can uh, read a lot of papers and and studies and look at even even things like sheet music that was inspired by the in, 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 um, invention of telephone. Uh, to try to make a sense about the way how uh, the telephone was becoming part of the cultural in different parts of the world. That obviously is related with also the idea that this cultural studies type of approaches would, would be, uh, should be, should be turned into cross-cultural studies. So tele telephone wasn't introduced simultaneously in, in, in different parts of the world and that matters. It wasn't introduce simultaneously different levels of the society in terms of social classes and that kind of things. So anyway, I think that these are the kind of issues that this kind of, so we say, cultural studies leaning type of media history is easily asking. But I do, do also think that in general, uh, perhaps, and this is a very, very difficult thing to say, is that that the, the this kind of historical scholarship very often um, uh, focuses more on a certain period, a certain moment, and the, the country, and and so sort of like tries to make sense of that 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 context here. Media archaeology is maybe a little bit more adventurous in the sense that you know it it tries to draw bigger links and connections and 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 uh, look at the the layers of culture di in different ways. And I think that here we come to back to this metaphor of the. Uh, Meta, meta, metaphor of the time time machine that I that, that I like using. So 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 my my research is about researching. Uh, I'm a historian by background. I mentioned already. So so researching very precisely certain moments in time. You know, but I am also very interested in looking what happens between different moments that are not always obviously related with each other. And this is where we, for example, got, get to this topos, topos archaeology. For example, so one 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 research topic that I've been dealing with is the idea about the medium main manias. Uh, so which which is often part of the introduction of a new technology. So uh, and I, I try to be brief because, because in the interest of time, but. But for example, when the kaleidoscope, which is a very, very familiar toy these days for children, when the kaleidoscope was introduced in the end of the eight, so just before 1820, by it was a it was a scientific uh, device actually by by uh, David Brewster David in Bruce. Scottish scientist, and it created. It looks like it created a big, big enthusiasm. People. Uh, went crazy for that device and uh, Franz Schubert, you know, the composer <laughs> became a kaleidoscope maniac no. and, uh, in the streets of Vienna. And uh, and and so, so uh, there is a lot of interesting material about that. I, I've written already about that and, uh, and there's more to come. But I mean that, but this is interesting. And, but then I, I think about um, what happened like five years ago when Pokemon Go was, was introduced. 
Yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, all these my students and and so many people around the world started running with their smartphones, you know, and uh, and hunting for these little monsters. And it was very, very difficult to talk to them even, you know, like, you know, the, I tried to ask questions, you know, and uh, it didn't work. But but when we look at the discursive uh, material, like on the YouTube or, or on, the, on, the, on the different social media sites, comments and, and, and suggestions uh, related with the early Pokemon Go mania, it is really striking how close those those comments are to the kaleidoscope kaleidoscope money that 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 <laughs> happened happened so much earlier and in a completely in many ways different cultural uh, situation so i think that these are probably the kind of questions that, that this kind of a more traditional media history would not ask you know so they would basically say well there are different contexts so the pokemon go uh, happens in the context of global popular culture. It has a kind of industrial franchises, and and uh, and 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 they would probably say it doesn't make sense to sort of like try to sort of like compare uh, those kind of things that are so far apart from each other. But I am I am making the claim that yes, it makes makes a lot of sense because both are in a way moments in that sort of like migration of a certain similar topos. And it did not start with the kaleidoscope either. I'm just going to ask another question about the collection then before we go to the other topics, okay? Yes, of course. So, Eki, I, I was curious um, to hear a little bit about the things you consider to be the treasures of your collection. And also yeah. if there is any object of fetish that you have there with you um i i don't think uh, i have any any fetishes and and uh you know no no collector will uh, publicly um <laughs> confess reveal <laughs> but but um but you i am i am fascinated of course with many kinds of things and um I don't think I collect anything as fetishes. I am, in that sense, I'm, I'm collecting as a researcher and scholar. So, and that's always been my, my principle. So, um, very often I needed to buy, buy uh, material because this material was unique. I couldn't find it anywhere uh, in, uh, in, in public collections, you know, they couldn't get an access to that. So, so there was a certain kind of an issue of saving things. Um, for example, I just um, just a few few days ago, I got a I got a bunch of bunch of early nineteenth century broadsides for popular shows. These are for Cosmorama shows and, and other kind of things, and. Uh, and I had to buy them when I found them from Europe because these are unique. There's only one single uh, of each known, and these actually come from Riga, from the from the Baltic, you know, from the early 19th century, because wow. the shows were traveling. So I have hundreds and hundreds of these kind of original documents. These are archival documents, or the uh, so when whenever I see a. Uh, Poster yeah. like this one, our new musical voyage around the world, an acre of illuminated moving canvas. So all of a sudden, when I see something like this, I notice that this is a moving panorama that's missing from my big book, Ill Illusions in Motion. You know, I didn't find it at that point. So, so, so this is a big motivation for for my 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 collecting. So, so it is not only the as I talked about the kind of tactile. This is a very, very rare, tiny moving panorama wow. toy. Uh, wow. so it, it, it's, it's not only the um, sort of like the objects and the touch, but it's also this, this significance and importance, you know, of preserving these things, you know, because otherwise they might might just uh, disappear somewhere. And and so that's why what reason why I try to put a lot of illustrations also to my my box because it is one way of sort of like and, making, and how, spreading it a little. 
And Professor, how many Magic Lantern devices you have? Uh, several hundred, uh, but I, I'm not a hoarding person, you know. I I don't like hoarding just any Magic Lantern. Um, so I'm uh, only buying Magic Lanterns that are important to understand the history of the Magic Lantern. And, uh, and these days I, I do believe that my collection is able to sort of like uh, pretty much tell the history with all the all the different kinds of devices. You know, you see one one magic lantern behind me uh, there in the corner on a original projection stand. So, so in that sense, I don't think the point is to sort of like collect like endlessly like all the magic lanterns I can find. I I don't I don't see the point. Yeah. I I only see the point of like um, kind of being a uh, make a difference between a phantasmagoria a magic lantern from the 19th century, early 19th century and then the improved phantasmagoria lanterns of the little bit later times and this this is not the same thing actually and uh, and and so but you only can have uh, you understand that that only the difference if you do have both original phantasmagoria lanterns and then the later improved phantasmagoria lanterns which is a different thing that's great that's great so can we talk about uh, uh, your big book like you said the moving panoramas uh, uh, can you please mrs pepper in the background um put the uh, insert here the image from moving panoramas and we can talk a little bit about about it please uh, how, how how many time did you spend uh, writing it? Because it's a kind of a very hair, a very difficult to find uh, theme in a single book. Uh, we have a little bit information about panorama, but uh, uh, panoramas in motion, it's a little bit more complicated. How did you start this research, Professor? So the um, book itself, took me a very very long time to research uh so over over 10 years and um and i think that it is understand e exactly like you mentioned um so 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 the issue was that um even though we knew that something called moving panorama existed i i felt that the moving panorama was really sort of like neglected by by scholars even the scholars who have been writing about panoramas so the standard was the so-called 360 degree circular panorama. So static uh, painting shown in like panorama rotundas. Obviously those are very interesting and fantastic. And I love uh, 360 degree panoramas, but I became intrigued by the fact that, that people, so in 19th century texts, people also talked about moving panoramas. And uh, obviously, it was clear that those panoramas in the in the in the rotunda buildings did not move. So that was something else. Uh, I think it was probably the um, uh, Ralph Hyde, uh, who was a great British uh, scholar um, uh, at the Guildhall Library, librarian there. Uh, I think it was probably Ralph Hyde who first made me interested in the moving panorama. Uh, Ralph was a wonderful scholar and. Uh, person uh, who's passing uh, some years ago, I, I never got over. I never had cre greater experiences talking about these things on a, on a very, very detailed level than with Ralph. So Ralph's work is, is truly wonderful and well-researched and uh, will live on. But so um, I got interested in the moving panorama and asked, asking questions, you know, what is this and how was it related to the circular panoramas and all these questions. And then I started going, uh, this was uh, now a long, long time ago, so around 2000, uh, 2001, uh, I think, I started going uh, to some collections and libraries asking questions and uh, and um, I can tell you a brief anecdote, which I, it's not written anywhere. Uh, so please, one please. of the early collections I, I uh, started exploring was the Harvard Harvard University, Harvard Theatre Collection. Okay. And I had been told that there probably are some, some good things about moving panoramas. So I went to Harvard and I um, uh, very hopefully I, I went to the uh, traditional um, uh, library catalogs, you know, 
cards, library cards, you know, not digital, went through that and uh, and spent some time and I did, didn't find anything. And I was very disappointed. I went to complain, uh, talk to one of the curators. I said, well, I was told that you might have people think you might have something about this thing called moving panoramas. And I explained a little bit and, and he looked at me, listened to me. He said, Professor, are you coming back in the afternoon after lunch? And I said, well, yeah, I can have a lunch somewhere around, you know, and, and I came back and, um, and I asked for him and he came with a, huge pile of cardboard boxes wow and none of the the this is a magnificent collection of broadsides and program leaflets for moving panoramas dioramas cosmoramas wow. but none of it none of it was cataloged in the really? harvard theater collection like and this is why he let me just use a photocopying machine and copy myself everything for myself wow as it, it's an anecdote, it, it basically shows that that and with all respect to that great um, great collection, that there was no respect at all for the moving panorama. It was ephemeral. So so this is the kind of one of the things that kind of slowed me down. But also, I mean that there were so many things to figure out from a pretty much forgotten medium. So people had knew very little about moving panoramas, very little had been written about it. So, so in a way I had to reconstruct the everything from the ground up. And, uh, and so I just saw years were passing by and I was working and uh, it was really very unlike a lot. But then Google, Google box started appearing, you know, like uh, 2000, 2004, I think, and um, and I r r discovered that quickly and, and started seeing that online I'll be finding sources that I would never find in these physical libraries or archives. And so I had very happy years, you know, like uh, making a lot of searches, for example, on Google Box. And, and these were great times. And I, I thought that Google Box is going to be the most amazing resource for uh, media archaeologists there's ever been in the, in the world. And it was that way for a number of years before the all kinds of uh, legal troubles started, kind of like all kinds oh, of okay. problems with, with copyright holders and things like that. And, uh, and, and, and then it collapsed. It's nothing uh, at all compared with what it used to be. And this is the bittersweet thing. So I was uh, able to write Illusions in Motion, fully profiting from that amazing material I was finding from, from these you know, online sources. And I, I have uh, found out since then that I don't gain access to much of the material anymore. Uh, mm. Google box. So there was a moment and a kind of window opening. I used the window, opened the window. I thought it will be open even wider, but it didn't. Wow, wow. And um, there is a, 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 a special chapter in Moving Panorama, uh, Panoramas, your book, related to the universal uh fair sorry uh what's the name 1900 uh universal exposition universelle 1900 de paris yes so it's uh, uh sorry about uh sorry about that so there is a, a, a in this moment it's a kind of uh, a very special moment in moving panorama because we have uh, many different uh, uh, kinds of moving panoramas and experiments like Cineorama, Transiberiana, uh, Cosmorama, Mariorama, etc. And also, it's uh, uh, at the same time that's the the highest point. After that, the uh, the moving panorama and the panorama house decreases. So. Uh, what happens in this moment? Why it goes so so high and then decreases so in so in a runway? So I think that we we should some somehow somehow 
sometimes be um, be suspicious about this little, like almost like symbolical turning points. I mean that if we think about the sort of like historiography, you know, like so this kind of millennial turning points are often you know like seen as like a like some kind of a decisive like uh, points when everything changes and. Uh, and it is difficult not to think about this uh, 1900 World's uh, World's Fair or the Universal Exposition in Paris in that that sense. Um, so to see it as a certain kind of a culmination of the, if we say that the 19th century, you know, in some sense was a century of the panoramas. So the most um, astonishing technologically, not only technological, but uh, also other sort of like kind of unusual panoramas were shown at, at the at the 1900 uh, Feltsware. But it was also the time when, uh, as, as you probably know, so Louis Lumiere uh, brought, the, brought the cinematograph, uh, uh, so-called cinematograph géant, so gi gigantic um, uh, large large projections with the with the Lumiere cinematograph, and there were a number of other pavilions, kind of like still not a little bit kind of modest, but but where the cinema cinema sort of like made its present presence felt, you know, for the for the audiences. But it's it's really is a, is a difficult to sort of like kind of like. So, so there are a couple of things to say. Obviously, this was a sort of like uh, national effort in, in France. They were fully conscious about the fin de siècle, a 1900 idea. So it probably sort of like inspired more investors to put money into these panoramic uh, attractions because these panoramic attractions at the 1900 World's Fair were commercial enterprises. So they, they were sort of like often needed a stock stock company behind it, you know, like people investing and hoping to make a big, big profit. That did not happen actually. But um, but so 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 there is a certain kind of infrastructure. So uh, these kind of huge panoramas don't appear out of nowhere. So it is it needs a lot of infrastructural development. Uh, it needs a certain kind of commercial interest very often actually and uh, and it's like ideological interest. And uh, the ideological interest was, of course, that uh, Paris was promoting its, uh, in a way, its itself as this kind of key key um, country, key society at the turning point of the of the new century. So, so there were many contributing factors why why those uh, unusual panoramas, including the most spectacular moving panoramas I think ever made, as you mentioned, Ryan, or so the Maria Rama, so Ugo Dalesi's uh, Maria Rama, which had two gigantic uh, moving panoramas rolling on both sides of a boat that was hydraulically rocking. So using a using a machine technology to make a big, big platform that looked like a boat to actually weave like 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 a boat would would do, or that then the um, then the um, other uh, panoramas, like the Trans Trans Siberian panorama, which was simulated railway journey between Moscow and uh, and uh, China. So many many uh, explanations. So I guess that um, so you want to ask uh, Raimo something about what, what what we are seeing on the screen right now. Yes, uh, because it's related with the moving panoramas in the exposition Universal. So uh, here we have your Mariorama has erected. And I would like to show to the audience uh, to uh, one point just and then I would like you to comment it. OK, so I will uh, insert to the right. Uh, Quite a thing. Okay, that's here. So here goes. As I mentioned, uh, so do you want me to speak from uh, Ville France and uh, just watch uh, and then the first speak. destination is the seaport of Sus.
So is this uh, uh, where is this drawn about? Is is the original from one part of Mariorama? This this image from Sus Port. Yes, this is um. Yes, this is. Yes, this is original from my collection. Uh, so the this is actually the um, uh, backside of the sheet music that was the music uh, composed for that particular uh, section of the of the Mario Rama. So the idea here was that the uh, audience that was gently uh, rocking on that simulated huge boat in the in the pavilion would be seeing uh, the uh, certain kind of a review of the uh, of the French Navy uh, as the boat was the simulated boat was moving past them and so so this big panorama wow it was freezed no Marcus his his image uh, for me it been... was okay actually Okay, I, we lost you for a few seconds. Erki, are you listening us again? I'm fine. Okay, yes. so let's go. Uh, yes. So the so what you saw here is a is a reconstruction of of a se sequence from the uh, Mario Rama, uh, which was shown at the Paris uh, Paris Universal Exposition. So these big canvases, as far as we know, have been completely lost. So, so we don't know exactly what happened to them. You know, uh, they were never shown in other cities as they were planning originally. But these sequences, um, these um, uh, survive as chromolithographic um, uh, illustrations on the backside of sheet music that was sold for people. So if you people wanted to re-experience what they had, had seen, they could actually play the uh, play the, with the piano in their privacy and uh, and look at the other side and they, they would see that sequence. So in a way, this is the closest we could get to sort of like kind of uh, experiencing what part of this Mario Rama uh, moving panorama show may have felt like. So and... Uh, and so this was basically the core of this um, stage performance that I created around it, around the Mario Rama. Uh, so the idea here is that um, that I have never wanted to sort of like um, uh, talk about media archaeology only by writing articles and books. But I, uh, I think that it is really important to sort of like try to sort of like look at other ways of like uh, getting into the past and, and uh, cre creating dialogues with the past. So that's why I've done a, a few installation work and, and, uh, and also uh, stage performances and magic lantern shows and that kind of thing. So it is, uh, it is another discourse of sort of like making media archeologically interesting and sort of like kind of, a, kind of like uh, understandable. Uh, for people, because you uh, uh, here in this presentation, this um, shows that the. Uh... Sorry. Here we see how the the. Uh... Yeah. So do you hear me? So we see that the uh, canvases also were swaying in in this kind of a uh, kind of like uh... so like a huge tanks. So, so the canvases were swaying, but uh, but also the the uh, the boat itself was swaying uh, by a hydraulic uh, so uh, system underneath. And uh, and here in this presentation that I think it was in two thousand and eleven in Pittsburgh, I, I think you look like a, a performer, a lanternist in this way of presenting with images and music in a life you are interacting informing entertaining uh, do you have uh, inspiration in this uh, very famous character from the 19th century the lanternist yes um so the I, I have to say that I have a certain kind of maybe a little bit theatrical side as well. 
and and it has to do with the fact that you know it's um, sometimes boring just to sort of like sit you know especially well in the past uh, past year I've been just sitting at home with my collection but um, for a very long time I've been interested in also sort of like uh, looking for different uh, ways of of sort of like bringing these ideas to the people that it would not I've been making recently YouTube video series and that kind of things. But I, I I do like this idea about the kind of um, theatrical presentation, so uh, appearing on the stage, and uh, so so and in those uh, performances, I normally try to uh, impersonate some kind of a, like an imagined character. So you might wanna wanna see that this is a more like a theater theater piece uh, on stage, and. Uh, I, I've done quite a few, and uh, and then sometimes you know it's a like in the role of the magic lantern showman actually. So with using the actually the magic lantern, uh, but it's it's not like uh, those magic lantern shows that I have given. They are not like trying to be a reconstructions of the 19th century like authentic lantern shows. Uh, and this is the exactly my background in uh, like new historicism. So, so which means that 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 I don't think that I can put myself completely from the present back to the past. It's more like a certain kind of negotiation of certain ideas from the past with the technology, but with by a person who's in the in the in the in the present. So you might say, say that it's a kind of a meta performance, meta performance. It's not like a historical play, you know, like a like uh, Henry VIII or something like that, you know. It's it's more like um, uh, somehow like uh, reflecting on that tradition, and and I think that it's a media archaeological idea as well, in the sense that here the the the, the contemporary moment somehow becomes becomes related. So I have a one joke in the Magic Lantern show, which which is to say that uh, show a smartphone and say. Somebody gave it to me. You know, I came from the 19th century, but somebody gave it to me, and I can't figure out how to how I can better get a picture from this if I put it in my in my magic lantern. You know. So before going going uh, further. Uh, how many presentations did you make from Mariorama Resurrected? Uh, and if you keep doing these presentations, so Raimo, you can invite me uh, when this this uh, current uh, thing is over. You can invite me to Sao Paulo to. Uh, yes, please. To, to I'd love that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, because I think that there is a very good balance between information and uh, and good information, precise, historical, with historical documents, and also a fl uh, uh, artistic flavor on it. No, so that appears to be a very ex explosive connection between these two: uh, the information and the entertainment. When they go together, wow. That's really a good point. And it, that's very touchable when you see Mario Rama resurrected that you can feel both these kind of these two elements that they are going together uh, on it. So um, uh, let's, let, let's change them, uh, teams. I would like also to know if you uh, have new projects what are you studying now? What are you researching now? What are you planning to the future? So um, I published recently a, a study about uh, self-driving cars, which uh, may sound like um, like a very far from my normal interest, but it, it's not at all. So uh, so I got really interested in this discourse about the uh, so auto automatic autonomous cars and things like that, and. Uh, and I, I uh, published a study earlier uh, last year in which I'm, I'm trying to sort of like um, uh, approach that idea from a kind of a media archaeological point of point of view. That article is easily available on online, you know, just like um, like um, my, by my name and self-driving car, it can be downloaded for free. 
but I have been uh, working uh, for a long time again on, on a new book, which is uh, called uh, How to Dismantle a Fairy Engine, Media Archaeology as Topos Study, in which I'm trying to sort of like summarize and, and show uh, my way of doing media archaeology. So, so basically the theoretical principles, uh, the background, uh, inspiration, uh, you know, and then um, apply. Uh, and, the, uh, and so the, the, the long chapters uh, in which I apply this idea have to do with um, magic, uh, magic mirrors, uh, uh, media, media, uh, so media manias, uh, uh, the um, cyborg, but cyborg uh, hundreds of years before the the uh, the current techno techno technocultural moment, and then there is a long chapter which is is really about internet actually, and um, and especially about forms like internet memes and the viral forms of communication, in which I'm trying to sort of like. Um, uh, ask this question uh, that in w in what sense, first of all, can we research the internet from a media archaeological point of view? And in what sense can we say that the media, that the internet itself is a certain kind of a machine or what I call fairy engine that, that creates like endlessly these kind of motives and ideas that are connected with the past and, and being modified. And I think that the internet memes are a very good example about that. So, so how memes started traveling, but their content uh, very quickly changes, and uh, people are adding other other new layers and modifications and variations to those 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 things. And um, and I'm uh, trying to sort of like ask this question: How does this? Um, kind of communication that happens very rapidly and quickly almost in real time on the internet in the internet context so how is it connected and and is it connected with the kind of like a much slower uh, topos topos uh, we say topos transmissions that have been happening for decades and centuries uh, forming these elements of the media culture little by little so, so these are the, 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 some of the topics in the new book. And uh, I, I'm, I'm just trying to finish the fourth uh, rewrite uh, right now. So I have already written the book three times. And now I'm this fourth, fourth time has to be the final time. And then hopefully it will be out. Yeah, so have two ends one but day. I, but I do have, I can mention very briefly, I have other projects that um, many of them, which I've, be working on for a long time too. So the so there's a book on the his, on the media archaeology of the screen, and this is a, another very long topic. So, but it's coming together little by little, and and I also have a really really fascinating uh, topic about which people know very little, which is a kind of a, a kind of a media archaeology of the so-called mechanical theaters. So these are some mechanical puppet theaters. And uh, this this topic is something uh, truly fantastic, and uh, it's a it's an amazing uh, journey that's um, I've already been researching since 2011, but it will probably be another sub several years before I can finish that. It's even less well known than the moving panorama. Erki, I was I was hoping to ask you a question about this project on screens that you mentioned, uh, because screens seem to be somehow a neglected topic also in the history of audio, audiovisual media, and uh, I, I think you are somehow rescuing the importance and the variations of screens that existed throughout history. Whereas we have the impression that the screen is somehow a standardized thing, uh, so could you talk a little bit about it? So in uh, yes, in in two thousand four, I uh, published a, a sort of like long kind of a programmatic article, which was uh, called "Elements of Screenology." This uh, this text was published in uh, Japan in the uh, in English, but in Japan in the Japanese um, iconics the uh, eminent Japanese uh, academic journal of visual studies. And, um, and I've since uh, published several follow-up 
texts. And, and in, in this, this um, the basic idea was simply that, that we, we often look, at, look through screens, we look to the content, but we don't look at the screen itself, you know, so to say, the, the, as a something like a material thing. So, uh, and I wanted people to start researching and looking the screen, looking at the screen itself and not just at the content on the screen. And look at look at it from a media archaeological point of view. So and uh, and so this this leads to these big questions, you know, like uh, so. We, we of course know that if we think about electronic screens, like television screens or computer screens, that 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 material history doesn't go back very far. But actually. If we do not only look at the material things, but also the certain kind of context within which those material ideas and engineering ideas develop. So we actually can see that the screen has been have developing for a much, much longer time. And here things like magic, magic mirrors, for example, would be an would be an interesting reference point. So the the chap chapter in this new book, which is about magic mirrors. And also in, influenced by the work of Stephen Herbert, actually Stephen's fantastic unpublished work, which I hope that we will we will soon be able to see. Um, so it is also connected with that that uh, screenology thing. But I'm also very interested in issues like um, if you look at the early discussion about the the object called screen or the whatever we call it, biombo or or many other things. So it first of all had very different functions uh, than this kind of media screens these days, mm -hmm. and many of these these early screens were about hiding things or protecting things from the fire or from the wind or from uh, you know protecting the privacy. So it raises interesting topos related issues about like are the screens really about about the ultimate visibility for everybody? Are the screens also about hiding something? Uh, and and has this idea changed radically from the kind of the Shakespearean era? You know the way how these kind of screens were used in uh, both in theater and and also in the homes and that kind of thing. So I noticed that this is just a simple example. Uh, we could also think about this sort of like magic lantern shows and the, the projection surfaces. So, so uh, in magic lantern shows, we we often think about the lantern itself, the lantern show as a kind of a practice. You know, the lantern lanternists traveling and, and what happened there, and we uh, and we and there's a, a a lot of attention these days to magic lantern slides as a kind of neglected form of visual culture. But but the element that gets very little uh, attention is the magic lantern projection screen. So where and and for what reasons were these images shown? And uh, and so I, I recently wrote, published a study about this topic, which is called the white behind the what the white behind the pictures. And I think that this whiteness behind the pictures. Is a is a media archaeological challenge. So we have to sort of like pay attention to elements that are normally neglected or forgotten or sort of like considered to be unimportant. And I, I would like to say that these these things are often very, very important. So so these are some of the things that this um screenology book uh, deals with. I I've read this article elements of the screenology that you mentioned. And one of the things that fascinated me is how it anticipates a very recent trend because it shows screens that are either squared or vertical. And nowadays with social media and with mobile phones, we are somehow inverting the direction of screens. We were a culture that were more accustomed to horizontal screens and now we see video vertically more and more each day. So what do you think that media archaeology thing can teach us in this moment where we are more and more relating to vertical screens? Yeah, this is the so-called vertical video syndrome, you know, and there's um there's a there's a lot actually syndrome. 
a lot of interesting uh, discussion also in the internet, and they actually use the concept verti vertical video syndrome, you know, for example, some <laughs> femi feminist interventions about like, you know, like, like why 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 that thing should be resisted you know it can be linked with the with the sexual politics and and that kind of things not only about material issues about and but i mean that that obviously i think that uh, it is it is really uh, annoying i think to watch on the computer screen or television screen like uh, vertical videos uh, because you, as you all know the left and the right have to be blanked artificially but on the other hand, we, we do have the, the world of social media where the where the vertical video starts making more sense too. So so it is uh, it is about uh, in the contemporary moment is about the tension between these these different platforms of viewing moving moving images, and I think that um, so the media archaeological uh, perspective. So what what it can provide is obviously try to see whether this kind of like uh, interplay between the horizontal and the uh, and the vertical whether it is just a certain kind of an um, uh, issue of the contemporary moment or whether that is a some kind of a tension an idea that that has has been happening uh, uh, in other contexts uh, too so transposed to other type type of like you know like uh, mat materialities and other type of discussions and obviously, another thing that can, could be linked with this uh, this also is the idea about the circular screen, which I think is a very interesting thing because the circular screen um, um, is re related, for example, with the so-called magic mirror. So if we imagine that for hundreds of years, people imagined that the mirror is not only about looking at your own reflection, but it is a way of traveling to other worlds and, and uh, communicating at the distance for for like gods or for the dead people or even living people, but who just happen to be very far far from you. So so those kind of screens were often e imagined as round screens, but not always. So this this whole idea about the kind of discursive history of the magic mirror as a way of really uh, sort of like uh, bridging uh, uh, distance, br bridging places and, and also bridging dimensions in time uh, is, a, is a very interesting media archaeological challenge. And, 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 and the one that we can, I think that in this kind of time, time traveling sense, we can, we, we, we can connect with the contemporary moment too. So, so, so the, this is not that sort of like the full answer, but there will be some partial answers in the um, in that book. Uh, I gave a talk about this uh, at the um, Rotterdam, Rotterdam Film Festival actually um, oh. some some years ago when there was a special program, uh, vertical vertical cinema, where the uh, idea was to sort of like. Uh, make films only for the vertical screens. It was actually shown on a special screen at the church, former church. So the, the screen was not horizontal, but was very, very tall, column-like vertical screen. So in that context, I, uh, I, I gave a lecture uh, looking at the archeology span of the vertical screen, but that's not yet published. So um, I would like to have this kind of privilege to talk directly with Professor Hutamo and ask about the uh, the use of the ex expression pre-cinema. Since we have been uh, changing messages in the internet for four or five years ago, in the first occasion that I mentioned the word press cinema, you just answer me like, I don't like this word. I prefer uh, archaeology of moving image. But I would like to uh, ask you if we are not, uh, not uh, today able to use the word press cinema since the cinema in the history of media is a kind of landmark. 
just a landmark like uh, so it's not uh, necessary have a teleological meaning and today that we don't have the the idea of the cinema it's not so huge that used to be in the 90s or the uh, in the uh, uh, change in the century because we have now the digital world and the many different screenings etc so the world of cinema it's uh, not uh, afraid my generation anymore and we can use the word press cinema like the way you use uh, the america before colombo america pre colombo doesn't mean that america was invented to one day to come a portuguese here and say oh we have you understand that do you think nowadays we can be able to use the word press cinema just like a reference I, um, I I I stick to my earlier sort of like point, which um, is that I mean the word pre cinema. So it's used also in Italian, pre cinema, and uh, pre cinema in French, actually very commonly. So uh, uh, I, from my sort of kind of like concept analytical point of view, it it is valid, but it's valid in a very limited sense. Because because it, it has this certain kind of teleological moment built into it. So so when you immediately when you say pray, of course you you mean that you have something uh, before that. And uh, and if you hear by the way something funny in the background, we are having a heavy uh, heavy rain shower that's banging yeah, that's on my windows okay. right now. Uh, but anyway, so so press cinema has validity. But it has limited validity, and uh, and I think that the the uh, it's a very simple way of answering this is that from my point of view, like if we talk about the archaeology of the moving image, it is uh, first of all much something much much longer, and it's 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 uh, layered, and uh, and so for me the uh, the so-called pre-cinematic technology of the 19th century, including uh, the works uh, by, of uh, Etienne Jules Marais that uh, Marta Brown discussed last week, and also many te technological devices as, as Steve, that Stephen Herbert has been um, sort of like um, talking about and including in his books. These many of them did have something to do with the coming of the cinema, but they did also have to do with many other things. So, for example, and my favorite example here, a simple example is that if we look at the zoetrope, as, as you know, like like here, so the zoetrope is basically a tactile medium. So it, this little zoetrope is is a personal medium and it's a tactile medium. Uh, so, so everything depends on what I do with the with the drum, uh, and and I have a personal relationship to that. So, in that sense, for me, the zoetrope is not that different from a interface point of view from handling a smartphone with swiping the screen. So, so and and the smartphone uh, is is something else, something different from the cinema as a historical form of media culture. So this means that. Many of the so-called uh, uh, so-called pre-cinematic devices are also part of many other histories. So um, um, other trajectories linking media with each with each other. So if we uh, adopt pre-cinema as a sort of like general concept and uh, use it uh, loosely, so so we we actually uh, I think we are. Uh, Missing or losing this certain kind of variety of these forms and and uh, and, and their their historical interplay with it, with each other, and that's why I I do if I use press cinema, it it has to be exactly on that 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 point. For example, say that in some sense, Magic Lantern shows did anticipate the early silent film screenings, and there were connections definitely. So if the point is looking at the earliest silent film and, and, and the link is with the Magic Lantern show, so we can say that in that sense, 
magic lantern show was a pre-cinema, <laughs> pre-cinematic form, but only in that sense, I, I would say. That's great. That's great. Fantastic. I would like to point a uh, um, epistemolo epistemological problem between optical and cinetic. I, uh, I, I have the idea, I'm, I'm a self-thought researcher, more related to the historiographical approach from the developing of technical techno uh, technology a historical technology. So I'm not so good with these kind of concepts, but I think the, uh, the concept cinetic, it's not moving image, but the illusion of moving image. So do you think the idea of uh, uh, the, the expression archeology span of the, not the moving, but the illusion of moving image should be fine to use it well i mean obviously you you can uh, adopt that kind of a way of thinking uh, and um, and i think that this is probably something that is very um, very uh, well uh, sort of like suited to thinking about go back to back, link with a moving panorama so so behind this door we have a moving panorama this is a toy version yes from a moving it. image and it has a crank and if i turn this crank the panorama starts moving but it is true that that um, this panorama here is moving in a different sense than than the images yes this is mechanical, and this is the uh, physiological. Is based, based on optical, physiological uh, operations that yeah. happen in, in our mind. Yeah. So moving panorama is, is not the same same thing. Uh, but, but I mean that obviously uh, these are two things that both fit, in, fit easily within um, media archaeological investigations, you know. But it is also true that, that what you say, that 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 we shouldn't uh, confuse and and mix these things um, with each with, with each other. So if we if we say that these optical uh, optical toys are some kind of moving moving toys and and uh, and a link with moving panoramas in the same sentence, I think that it is possible that we are causing confusion rather than uh, clarifying things. Yes, in the, also in uh, visual arts, the word cinetic, it's a little bit complicated comparing with our approach because it just, it's just movement, but not the illusion of movement. And so the illusion are, of yeah, so they're talking about like kinetic art. Uh, kinetic art is, ba is based on the idea that, that of creating artworks that that I think have two forms of existing. So they have their materiality, which is obviously the system. And then when you put it in motion, uh, you actually have a certain kind of virtual play of light or optical illusions. And, and <clears throat> that, <clears throat> that's when, when it becomes really kinetic. So we can talk of, think about Moholy, Laszlo Moholy Nagy's work, uh, works or the kinetic arts that, uh, were created in the 50s and 60s, also by many artists from the Latin America, actually. So Boto, Marta Boto, and, and, and those other people. And obviously this, this, this kinetic art, you know, in that sense is related with those early devices like uh, zoetropes and things, but it is not an obvious and, and a simple connection. So, so it would be a mistake to sort of like basically like sort of like link these two two together because because there there are many other contributing factors that come from the sort of like the um, challenges of um, modernism in the art itself and the sort of like kind of the the critique of the of the physical um, physical art art object and you know like and also the uh, and and another element which is of course machine culture so the role how not only optical devices, but but machinic devices became part of the uh, part of the 
world of work and part of the world of home and how that happened from the 19th century and early 20th century. So the machine is an, uh, one element uh, that contributed to the coming of the kinetic art. So, so it, it is not only something that developed from the, let's say, 19th century optical toys, or optical devices. So, so simplification is a, is a problem if we, we, we count, uh, count out these other layers. And do you think uh, it's necessary to make this difference and don't call the zoetrope like an optical uh, device, but a synthetic device? And, uh, and also the others. It's not moment well, I, to make the, this kind of difference, if you understand me. Well, uh, well, I, I do, I do, I don't, I don't see fully that 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 need actually because it is certainly an optical device, and uh, and I think optical toy. When we talk about philosophical toys and optical toys, is it, that's that's something which is very very deeply rooted already in our understanding, you know, and. Uh, and I think the basis of this this um, <clears throat> this thing is optical, even though, for example, in this case, there are no lenses used. That kind of thing, you know. But it is it is an optical illusion, you know, that happens, you know. That um, so so when you have a like a like a strip of images like this, and at one point you have it in motion. So obviously, you are not looking anymore, like Marta. Martha Brown well explained last week. So, so you're looking at something different actually when, when, when the when the drum is spinning. So it's it's not no no longer the same thing. So in that sense, I would say optical. Talking about optical uh, functions perfectly, but I mean that this the connotations of the word uh, synthetic or kinetic. Uh, are definitely worth worth thinking about uh, in in relation to other forms of motion, you know, movement, and this is also the question of physical movement, like like a like a self driving car driving. So so on the on the road. So in what sense can we say? So in this article that I mentioned that I published, I am um, so the one of the point points in that article is to try to say that. Um, Self-driving car is a new kind of a media machine, but it is a media machine for post humans. So it is not a media machine for the human, even though it transports people. But it is a media machine that communicates with other machines and networks, you know. So the self-driving car is full of technology, sensing technology and effectors and lidar lidars which is a panoramic uh, device panoramic uh, technology actually forming a 3d map of the car uh, at any any moment you know that kind of things so 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 in that sense uh, like self driving car is definitely a, a media machine i think and and it is using a lot of uh, it's a concentrated you know like uh, sort of like uh, media concentration of different kinds of media technology, but it also has other functions. And these functions come from transportation, uh, technological operations, you know, and that kind of things. And that's why it is interesting. So so maybe you want to have a look, somebody wants to have a look at that article, but uh, but that's, um, yeah, it's it's easy to, easy to, easy to uh, find, or I can send it also to, uh, to uh, Raimo. That's great. That's great. You have a, a question, Marcus. I have a question. Yeah, it occurred to me when you guys were talking about pre cinema and this problem of terminology. And well, I wanted to ask you, Erki, about a background question that I think it's related to that, which is the question of whether culture creates a technology. So everything that comes before somehow culminates into a technology. Or, as some would argue, that a new technology creates a new culture. So what do you think of that? Which one uh, is more precise to, to describe what happens? Well, yeah, this is the, uh, this is the chicken and the egg, 
big problem of 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 I think media <laughs> culture, probably media <laughs> archaeology too, and, uh, <laughs> and and so there's uh, any any amount of like argument that happens immediately when you when you uh, sort of like mention this this idea. So so which which came first and which determine de determines which and. Uh, and and they, there's no way of uh, denying that this is. I guess it is one of the foundational questions, uh, not only of like media studies, but perhaps it is also cultural studies. And and you know that there's been a very strong emphasis in this materialist line of uh, uh, media archaeology, uh, emphasizing the idea that actually that. Uh, technological devices become agents functioning on their own you know so this uh, not only that the uh, self-driving car drives on its own uh, with without necessarily the will of the human you know because it is it is yeah so it is um, also some people linked it with with artificial intelligence but not not all not but anyway so if we think about for example, Wolfgang Ernst's way of thinking of media archaeology. So Wolfgang is very interested in the way how, uh, like, phonographs and and uh, gramophones, uh, phonographs as a recording, sound recording device, became a certain kind of an agent on its own. It it has a certain kind of way of recording something by its by itself and and uh, and and storing it, you know. And 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 we could probably uh, like Hitler already what Friedrich Hitler doing linking it with the computer, the way how computer uh, sort of like uh, operates in the same way. And then we have this other other side which is much more sort of like content context orient context oriented in a in a many way saying that that any technology cannot uh, appear to a vacuum. And, and it can never appear and appear to also function in a vacuum. And, and it's a, of course, it's a very, very clear simplification to say that the second point of view is the typical, more like a cultural studies point of view in a sort of like Anglo-American world. But, but there is a little bit of truth in that, that as, as well. And I have to say that my, my way of thinking is somehow probably more, 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 more in line with this second way of thinking. So the uh, because I was educated as a cultural historian, where the most important thing was always to sort of like try to contextualize everything we talk about. So whether we talk about the Renaissance painting or something. So the idea is that these 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 um, these ideas are, are not sort of like kind of inherent only in the painting, but they are inherent in the culture. And we have to use the painting, for example, as a kind of a way of penetrating that much bigger cultural context. And that context is, is not only the context that's happening at that moment, but which has happened at other moments before that. And this is actually what I uh, guess that uh, is, is my, my legacy from like classics like Abi Warburg, the great uh, pioneer of visual culture studies. Um, whose work with this aspect I very much identify with. So, so in my way of thinking about, so I always say that technology, media technology, understanding media technology is extremely important, you know, and uh, and and there are moments that it, it looks like the media technology is taking initiative, you know, in a way like um, sort of like becoming somehow like autonomous at least for a mo quick moment you know like affecting the things but i think that in the long run and in a, in a more serious sense we are always uh sort of like conditioned by culture and we are conditioned um, by the semiotic nature of culture so the idea that we are only and this is my legacy from from semiotic studies a long long time ago is that I think that we are always related with culture through semiotics, semiotic processes, semiosis, so through science, and uh, and we cannot avoid it. So, for example, when Wolfgang Ernst writes about the certain kind of autonomy of the phonograph or something like that, so 
Wolfgang cannot explain, cannot escape the idea that he is a human observer, human interpreter, who, who has to approach the phonograph through processes of science. So Wolf cannot ex Wolfgang cannot explain himself away from the picture. This is a we are good friends, so this is a, like a very like a pleasant pleasant point of argumentation that 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 we often have, you know. Uh, and I think it's an interesting and I I important argument. So it's a friendly argument, but but it just shows that that there are many many uh, perspectives to these very foundational questions. That's great. Uh, we are uh, almost two hours long conversation. It's really delicious. I, I, I have a feeling that it started 15 minutes ago, but we, I think we have not to take much time from the professor. So we are going calmly until the end. And I would like to ask your uh, opinion in a... Um, uh, about uh, Richard Krangel techniques of the observer and the, his legacy in studying the philosophical and technological points in 19th century. So you actually talk about Jonathan Creary. Jonathan Creary. What, what did I say? Richard Krangel. Oh, bah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Richard, Richard Krangel will be interviewed in Flickr and Flow in the fifth ep episode. So this is Jonathan Crary. I'm sorry. And yeah. you wanted also to interview Jonathan Crary. So maybe that's why there was a confusion here, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So they, uh, of course, I mean that this is another big, uh, big topic, uh, and I think at, after two hours of talking, it's best to be kind of very brief. But I, I can also say that you know, like uh, from a historical point of view, uh, I read the book very quickly. So when it was published, I think uh, 1989, if I uh, or 1990. And like most people, I think was uh, I was I was intrigued by the by the work, and I think that one of the uh, one of the issues was that they was talking about things that were new for many people at that point. You know, like uh, trying to give a sort of kind of a interpretation about the optical technology, so from camera obscuras to stereoscopes and so on, that people hadn't been thinking about. And also, it was a it was an effort to apply Foucault, so Foucault's idea of epistems uh, to the to the world of media culture, as you all know, uh, is the um, so Foucault has often been criticized by the fact that you know that that in his work on the archaeology of knowledge, he actually did not pay too much attention to the materialities or to the channels or to the media through which those, those uh, fragments of culture that, that he dealt with or, or the discourses he dealt with were actually manifested in themselves. This is also a critique that Friedrich Kittler made about, made even in his uh, famous uh, Discourse Networks book of, of Foucault. So what, what Jonathan Creary was trying to do, I think, was taking this kind of a Foucaultian approach towards uh, towards um, sort of like uh, media culture, and and position a, a sort of like a rupture he um, um, per perceived very clearly. Uh, this is of course well, very well known because it's a foundational for the book. So from the camera obscura view to the view of the sort of like physiological optics and happening sometimes in the 1820s and 30s and using this as a moment uh, also of basically like proposing a huge modification of the uh, world of art history so basically saying that the the uh, the modernist turn you know actually that people normally i associate around 1900 or in the late 19th century could be so works like Sora or Signan and that kind of things could be actually put, pushed, pushed back in time to another point. So he was a very radically uh, ambitious young uh, scholar who wanted to leave his mark, I think, you know, with a big, big theory. 
But unfortunately, uh, this theory was false from the beginning. So actually, uh, Jeffrey Batchen, uh, uh, another person who, whom I appreciate a lot. So Jeffrey showed, uh, wrote a very, very devastating uh, uh, review to the After Image magazine soon after Creary's book was uh, published and where he uh, demonstrated very clearly that 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 it was based on a very well, like a hand -picked, hand picked version of the past and so if you actually consider that in a wider context of culture so the rupture doesn't make sense anymore and and jeffries i i don't, cannot go into that detail but i can also send that text to Raimo to share for others if you want but in that text basically he was he was being a, he was a photography historian so jeffrey so he paid attention to the uh, lack or the absence of photography from Creary's um, book. And the photography was, a, without any doubt, one of the most important technological uh, innovations of the 19th century. And, uh, and uh, it really continued the uh, tradition from the camera obscura model. So Creary was basically saying that there was a big transition where we moved away from the camera obscura model to that other model but when we really look at the the culture uh, in 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 general we actually noticed that this camera obscura model was very dominant in many forms all through the to the 20th century and it it still exists in many ways so the problem probably uh, and this is how i see it now many many years later is that that he was he was very very kind of eager to make this huge and big Foucault and certain kind of rupture. Uh, if he hadn't done it that way, he wouldn't have got that much attention. But also, he the book would have been more lasting in its value, because I I think that you know that uh, even Creary himself in his latest book twenty four slash seven no longer seems to be believing in that kind of like rap, rapid and sudden raptures in culture. So he he uh, supports a much more sort of like layered and gradual sort of like uh, sort of like model, which I think is something that is uh, actually very much more based, is, is like uh, very much present in my way of looking at media culture. So, so I, I don't, uh, even though Foucault influenced me like many others a lot, I don't, I don't look look at culture in terms of sudden rapid ruptures happening on different levels of time it's more like a more more sort of like layered layered process where transitions happen but the transitions are about complexity of culture and the fact that we talk about many layers and i'm sure that creary as a great scholar understood it perfectly he just wanted to make a Make a make a big big a big sort of like Foucault and sort of like a, a little bit arrogant sort of like uh, move, and that move worked perfectly well in the sense that he really got a, a lot of attention and and the book really stimulated a lot of uh, discussion and uh, that is not a mean uh, mean uh, achievement. I mean it's it's something great and uh, and so great books are the, often the ones that create discourse. So, so even though they may be flawed somehow, but if it, it's great, so it, it produces this, it's a generator for discourse. Same way as the books of Marcel McLuhan in the 1960s, Understanding Media and uh, Gutenberg Galaxy are, are very problematic books in many ways, but these books were super influential in inspiring scholars, and they still inspire scholars, and and that is is a is another great achievement. Fantastic, fantastic, Marcus. Uh, do you have a last question? Uh, no, I'm fine. Are you fine, fine. Yeah. Uh, Professor? Are you fine as well? Yes, I am. I am fine. So, do you want to see something? Uh, yes, as of a, course. As a, as a one final. Please. Okay, I'll show you something that I never shown anybody. So now I will show it. Uh, wow! Thank you very much. Yes, take your time, please. Well, what you have? What I have here? It's hidden. Uh, 
uh, it shows that that for example moving panorama uh, was a much much more complex thing than for example uh, uh, i presented in the illusions in motion because i did not have this thing at that point <laughs> this, is, this is a renaissance era moving panorama okay which is related with a uh, from 1510 Renaissance time and related, ah. with, related with Henry, the King Henry the Eighth, uh, in the, and, uh, and the uh, in England, and uh, it's a very very rare one. Wow. It was obviously not released as, as this edition and the uh, in the fifteen ten. So basically, what it shows it it is a procession to um, celebrate the birth of the first child prince henry of henry the eighth but then when this was discovered it was published as this limited edition in 1726 wow by the english society of antiquarians and this wow. is the original one here from 1726 so over half a century before the french revolution that's so amazing. I just wanted to show you that, that for example, when we look at moving panorama from a media archaeological point of view, there are always things to discover. And when you discover something like that, so it forces you to sort of like partly kind of re-estimate the structure of, of your work between all those different elements. So so maybe this is because I have never shown this uh, publicly anywhere. So, so maybe this is a kind of good... Uh, Kind of a moment to end, and, and also to thank you guys for asking so many challenging <laughs> questions, and and I also thank the audience, hoping that this discussion will be uh, was and will be useful, in some senses, sort of like clarifying those issues what media archaeology can achieve. Yes, thank you very, very much. I would like to thank you, Professor Marcos Bastos, as well. It was a great, great pleasure to talk it's uh, uh, impressive how many uh, your p capacity of creating ideas creating uh, bat batches are uh, concepts uh, it's uh, uh, in how wonderful and the passion you uh, yeah I, I we notice in the way you study in the way you talk in the way you show it was really really a great pleasure to have you here in Flickr and Flow. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you for the invitation. It was super nice. <laughs> okay. Right. So, yes, and of course, we have to sort of like, uh, I also, thanks for me, thanks for having me, and uh, and let me say one more time, Raimo, that, that I really uh, think it's a very uh, interesting and important initiative, and uh, in these times when many of us are locked into our homes and and uh, uh, so i think that this kind of like uh, international uh, sort of like way of exchanging ideas and presenting ideas needed more than ever yes and i i love your uh, uh pandemic style with long hairs <laughs> i think it's it came to came to stay probably yes please <laughs> so thank you everybody say uh, uh, next week we are going to talk with sion king the curator of kingston museum and it will be a pleasure to have you the oldest again here so see you bye bye ciao ciao Bye. bye.